Sea turtles use the Earth's magnetic field to orient themselves. Could I have used the magnetic field to orient myself on the bridge? <laughs> Those topics and more in this week's Biotrekkie with the Admiral, starting now. Hello, and welcome back to Biotrekkie with the Admiral. I'm Mohammed Noor. I'm a biology professor at Duke University, and I'm an occasional science consultant for the Star Trek universe. I'm here with the Admiral herself. Jane Brooke. Brooke. <laughs> I, I played Admiral Katrina Cornwell in the first two seasons of Discovery, and I'm here today as Mohammed's friend and enthusiastic biology student looking to learn more about biology here on Earth through the lens of Star Trek. So today we're talking about episodes eight and nine in terms of biology, a little bit more, episode eight. Uh, and as I ask every week, uh, Mohammed, tell us a few things, uh, summarize for us a few things that stood out for you um, in these episodes. Sure, thank you. So with episode nine, as you mentioned, the, that's, there's not a whole lot of biology there, but there were some callbacks to some of the earlier seasons of Discovery. So we got to see more about the Kelpians. We saw mentions of the Vaharai, the, the threat ganglia came up and things like that. I'm not gonna talk about that. I have a video already about that in this channel. It's called Natural History of Species on Kaminar. I'll put a link to that at the bottom of, uh, of this YouTube. But for this, for the, uh, episode eight, where I thought there was a lot of really cool biology, there were two things that really uh, struck me with respect to the sea locusts. First is, you know, thinking about how do animals on earth disperse and related to that, how do animals on earth communicate? Now in this episode, there was some sort of electromagnetic connection, they said, that was between the sea locusts each other, and each other in terms of uh, telling each other where to go. And also that was something that Book and his brother were able to intercept and communicate with them to tell them to move away. So that was pretty cool. But I'm happy to talk about dispersal and communication. It's just sort of a one-off in terms of the sea locusts themselves. I just thought the way they floated was kind of cool. They have, they have like a little balloon on top. It made me wonder how they do that. So one thought I had, this is a little bit of a crazy thought. There's some algae on earth that can break the hydrogen out of water. So maybe they do that and fill it up with hydrogen, which of course is much lighter than air and, the, and they can float around. The danger of course to, with that would be that um, if they come anywhere near a flame, there'd be big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say you'd be flammable, yeah. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I loved what was interesting to me is that they made an invasive species who literally uh, it was ruining the crops and making people starve. But they made this invasive species so whimsical and yeah. book talked to them. I mean, he and his brother, but at the beginning when he, you know, got them to part for uh, for him and, and Michael, um, for himself and Michael. It was just so whimsical and they were beautiful. They and were they just very had to beautiful. be, yeah, it was kind of like, uh, you know, it reminds me of St. Francis talking to the animals or the, uh, you know, a, a Buddhist type of asking the ants to leave, you know, the stories, it was just so gentle and a, a nice um, portrayal of an invasive species being, um, kindly you know, good displaced within themselves they yeah. just were in the wrong place yeah. and they were unintentionally hurting so that was nice the i like it was that. really cool yeah well i can build a little bit on that in terms of the locusts so i mean i'm not sure if a lot of people are familiar locusts are, they look just like the grasshoppers that you might have in your yard pretty much i mean not exactly but pretty close to that um they don't communicate using electromagnetic radiation <laughs> go figure <laughs> <laughs> there are, I tried to actually see, I was like, is there any study looking at effects of electromagnetic radiation on locusts? And there are some that which actually showed that, you know, strong EM fields can, can mess with locusts, but that's not the same as them communicating with Communicating. Them. Yeah, that, 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 that doesn't happen. <laughs> Don't they rub their legs together? So oh, they're grasshoppers. <laughs> I, somebody rubs their legs together. Yeah, yeah, to do the chirp, chirp, chirp. <laughs> yeah. The locusts are usually pretty solitary, but they, they, you know, they're just off eating their own thing. But what will happen is then they get a signal which then initiates the swarm. And it could be it could be a pheromonal signal. It could be something about them touching each other in particular ways. But it's a response to overcrowding. When they get overcrowded, that's when they just... <laughs> It makes the, oh. the it makes the big outbreaks as you hear them, and those outbreaks can last years. They can have millions of locusts, and they just all travel together and essentially just ravage areas. Yeah, this whole the, the biblical isn't that one of the curses? Exactly. One of the biblical curses, the curse of the locust taking exactly. the exactly um, exactly, uh, which is why it was so interesting the difference because this was kind of 
the curse of the sea locust yeah. but it was not but they spoke to them and they were they were cute they were yeah. cute little things <laughs> uh, very but they, if it was the hydrogen i'm glad they didn't try to set them on fire because they would set the whole forest on fire <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that would have been terrible yeah. leave it to osira that was her name to do yeah, that right yeah that would have been her that would have been um, her approach that's true so yeah. in terms of dispersal, though, like, I mean, lots of animals use some sorts of cues. And what's interesting is some of them do actually use magnetic. Now, this is a little different. They use magnetic cues. So sea turtles, for example, will use the Earth's magnetic field to orient. And that's oh. how they can basically try to find uh, the beach that they came from after they leave. So they'll return to the same beach and, and try to find the same electromagnetic position. <laughs> like in Nemo, like yeah. the movie Nemo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was so sweet. It's amazing that they can do that. And the way uh, researchers, or one of the ways researchers study is, is basically to try to disrupt the field and see what it does in terms of where they're going and things. So you could, for example, encircle a sea turtle with something that makes an artificial electromagnetic field and it completely throws off where they're going. Or they might strap, you know, magnets to their backs or something like that. And yeah, again, but I hope that they... Um... They don't leave them like Put that. Put them it's back just, yeah. into their normal thing. I mean, that's very temporary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for making that clear. <laughs> Everyone's now going to be worried about all these sea turtles. Yeah, they're know? lost because they have no. the magnet strapped to their back. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> There's been more work in homing pigeons too, where people again will strap like a magnet to the back. And again, some of them do seem to use magnet. It's kind of amazing that things can do that. But so amazing. Yeah, that's that's off our radar. Um, but a lot of species use, of course, different kinds of signals in terms of dispersal. And um, they'll often look like, say, for example, the relative location of the sun or the moon. So one interesting one, this is something I actually just learned this year and I thought it was fascinating. Moths, right? You know how moths will come and they'll, they'll come up to a light and they'll start circling it and things yes. like that? Right? Yeah. So they're not, people say they're attracted to the light. It's right. not actually exactly right. What it is, is they're looking, for, so it, moths will fly like that at night and they orient relative to the brightest thing, which is usually the moon. Now, if they're flying and now all of a sudden there's these lights oh. everywhere, it throws them off. So they're like, the, they want the moon to be at, say, like, you know, a 25 degree angle this way. So they start flying, but then all of a sudden there's a brighter thing at 25 degrees. So then they just keep turning and they keep going in this circle because. Oh, <laughs> poor things. Right? Turn your lights off, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, just right. learned that. I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. But it's, it's, I mean, now, of course, they're not consciously thinking about it, but that's just no, the no. way they've evolved. It's just essentially they have a signal and response. And that signal and response has now been hijacked by our, our, our artificial lights. <laughs> well, our artificial lights do a lot of damage. They do a lot of damage to birds yeah, yeah. who um, don't know where they are and fly into the high rises with the you know lights and all that. So yeah, yeah. we don't well, want to get too sad about all the, uh, but yeah. Yeah, with, with yeah. us, it's interesting. A lot of uh, a lot of our ability to navigate is, is controlled through our hippocampus. And actually I found a really interesting study. This is done I forget, maybe like 20 years ago or something like that, but they, uh, they looked at London taxi drivers and looked at the sizes of their hippocampus relative to other people and they were bigger. And it actually correlated with the length of time that people had been driving had been... a taxi. <laughs> How interesting, because the thing about London taxi drivers, now it's a little different now because you know Uber and people ordering, but traditionally the London cabbie was the guy who knew everything. I mean, he, exactly. knew, he would get in his cab and you would say the most, you know, uh, littlest street, you know, far away. And he would be, all right, love, you know, and he'd get you there. Yep. And you exactly how to get there. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got in a London cab a couple of years ago and plus they don't look the same anymore. They don't, you know, but, uh, I think the man actually might have put on his navigation and I was like, no, no. <laughs> you're supposed to do it through your big hippocampus. I'll say right. that from now on. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> but your hippocampus is just like mine now. It's there not you bigger. Go. <laughs> um, so good. Now, have we addressed communication? Between oh, yeah. Sorry. I had to come back to that. I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Yeah. So the, at the intersection of sort of dispersal and communication, there's a really cool thing, which I know many people are probably familiar with who are watching this, and that's how honeybees know where to go, right? And they, how they communicate. So, you know, we have these honeybee foragers that come out of the hive. Uh, they identify a good source that they, that they want to tell the other bees to come to. They come back to the hive and they do a little dance, right? <laughs> They're like, I found it. I yeah. found it. Yeah. But it's not just telling them they found it, but it's 
actually telling them where it is, how far away it is. They're giving them like a lot of fairly detailed information to have them get it. Part of it is based on like the way they do a run and then they waggle their butts in a particular ways and things like that. But that tells them the way they're doing the run, the angle with which they do that is kind of the angle relative to where the sun is. So it's basically giving the bees information on how to go out there and find it. So there's been a lot of studies on this. It's really cool. And what, what some scientists have done, they've even made these little robot bees <laughs> and tried to send the other bees out to a particular place. You mean a little robot bee that will do a dance to yeah. see if the real bees will follow? Do exactly. the real bees follow? Well, they won't, they won't they... fly out with them, but they'll do the dance and they'll see if the bees will go to the place that the to dance go to is where the robot it. said. Exactly. Do they? Do yeah. they? Yeah, yeah. it's not perfect, but it, I mean, they're, they're still working on it right now. There's a website, it's called like Robo Bee or something like that. Yeah, the, and then they come the back to the hive and they, they're you like, know, and then they liar. gang up on the Robo Bee. <laughs> you liar. <laughs> Kill him. Right. <laughs> they start taking apart the robot. Right. Um. <laughs> there are, though, coming back to the electromagnetic things, there actually is one paper I found. I don't know if this is still accepted or not. There was one paper from 2013 that said that bees partially will do this in terms of the communication of where things are um, using um, uh, electric fields. <laughs> Huh. I'm not sure. Like I said, I found one paper about that, so I'm not. Right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't swear that's right. But there are fish, for example. So it's not unheard of. There are fish that use uh, sort of rudimentary electric communication, where they'll they'll send off these slight electric waves to signal, you know, threats or something like that. So it's not. It's not crazy. It could. It could be. And this is all stuff that we are just completely not equipped for. Right. Interesting. <laughs> so the human Homo sapiens just didn't get any of this. Nope. Nope. We're yep. doing our, we're doing our verbal and visual and that's it. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. Maybe a little bit of pheromonal, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. So fascinating. Yeah. And we don't, if we don't get still sometimes and look outside of ourselves to see that magnificent yeah. uh, There's a dance lot that's happening and that. everything going on, instead of just thinking it's all about us, but we got to, yeah, that, there's a lot of stuff happening. I'm going to look at moths, never the same at night anymore. I'm going to run inside and <laughs> turn off my so lights. Like, no, no, keep yeah, going. I'm going to say, no, don't be confused. I'll turn off my light. Yeah. To see him go off or her. That's right. That's right. Um, like you said, it's, it's fascinating moths? how much yeah. is happening that we just don't pick up on. There's, some, we just don't there's pick up. signals and things like that. It's just like, don't notice. You know, the, the bee thing I pick up on because I have the Orioles come to my yard every spring and they come and that's a cool thing because once they find your yard, they and their babies will keep coming back to your yard. That's where they'll oh, come back. Um, so I get them and then it becomes crazy because I've had so many generations. There's too many of them. But um, if I put jelly out, it can only be out for a particular amount of time until that, oh, um, until that be the, what do you call them? The, the forager. Reconnaissance, yeah, for, forager bee. I can see one or two bees discover it. <laughs> and then I know that I have to bring the I jelly see. in because yep. they'll kill themselves in the jelly. They'll get all, you know, they'll be like, ah, you know, and they'll get, mm. yeah. So I bring the jelly in the minute I see one of those. I didn't know he was called a forager bee, but now I know. Oh, yeah, she, but that's cool. <laughs> she, or she was called, yeah. Oh, good. So when I see the forager gals, I have to pull this, pull that jelly in. Yeah. Um, I actually have a funny, you can't answer this, but I did have a funny, it, it kind of, this is totally a non sequitur, but I looked at my notes for episode eight, and I remember thinking in those scenes with, um, Grudge, it's grudge, right? Yeah, the cat. There were a couple scenes. That, there is a particular species of cat, which I can't remember, that is very, very floppy and you hold it and it just flops. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking, I'm wondering if that grudge is that species or did they give him a whole lot of catnip? Because there was a scene, there was a scene in there, you remember when he was just, just totally flopping and I'm thinking, did they drug that cat? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't have because there's all these sorts of rules, but um, that's... Is this, this when he jumped in the lap with Andorian? Yeah, he jumped in the lap, yes, in, the, in with Detmer. Yeah. And um, he he was nervous at first, jumped in the lap, and then he was just... Yeah, you know, it was kind of funny. Like, he jumped in the lap of this complete stranger just going to hang out there. And that then was he, a just, fun. <laughs> he just flopped. And there is a species of cat. Um, this, You know, I, I it was just funny. I, I said, I have in these notes, you know, the cat was so relaxed. Um, you know him? That's that's Mary Wiseman's husband. 
Oh, the Andorian was? Yeah, yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> oh, what fun. I'm glad for so, on so many different levels, that would be fun because um, just because of the pandemic, you can't travel yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Um, so that's nice. That it was neat seeing him with scenes together too. could come up and too. stay and do yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, fun. That's great. I didn't I, know that. I had a question for you. So in, in, oh, that, okay. in that same episode too, that there were there were a lot of times. And this is true, like throughout the series, but I especially yeah. noticed in that episode, there were a lot of times where you know it would flash on various people in the bridge crew, like Lieutenant Nilsson or somebody like that. And you know, her entire role was, you know, right. <laughs> look over that way or something like that. Right. You know, she and she obviously has a station too. So I sort of two kind of related questions. What's do you think that's frustrating for actors to just have a role where like literally their entire role for the episode is? you know, <laughs> look right. over in a direction. And also like, I know you, I think didn't have a particular station. What was it like for you in terms of when you were standing on the bridge and things like that? Well, um, I'll go with the latter question first. It was, it did become, um, you know, those are hard scenes to, for a director to direct and catch everything, especially if there's something chaotic going on, you know, mm -hmm. he tries to catch, he or she tries to catch, uh, everyone's reactions and you have to do it again and again and again. Um, for me, when I was on the bridge as an admiral, I was the highest ranking person there, but I didn't have a station. I didn't have a place to go. And it's very beautifully designed and modern. And if you don't have a specific place to go, the captain's chair, the science station, you know, navigation. Um, I remember sometimes I'd be saying, or the director would be saying to me, uh, where should we put you now? You know, and usually it was, it, we're usually it was next to the director's, I mean, to the director's chair, to the captain's yeah. chair. But um, it, 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 that, that was an issue for my character eventually. And um, one of the smaller reasons probably that they needed to get that admiral off. <laughs> oh, that's it. Because what would they do? I mean, like, what would she do? Yeah. What would her job be? Anyway, um, and in terms of being one of the bridge crew, you know, the special thing about Discovery and that cast from, uh, you know, being able to comment on the actual atmosphere of shooting it, you know, I, of course, actors want to be given something they can sink their teeth into, of course, but uh, especially for younger actors, it's so exciting to have a job, you know, but also because Sinequa, and I've mentioned this before in other places, I don't think here in this podcast, but Sinequa is such a wonderful number one. And when I say number one, I mean, number one on the call sheet, but mm -hmm. that as my mother used to always say, fish stinks from the head down. So <laughs> That's um, a great quote. Yeah. So Sinequa is such a great number one. She truly is so open and loving and excited. And there's not a whiff of um, hierarchy. Right. Yeah. So with that bridge crew, I noticed when I joined, because I joined after they had done the pilot and a few episodes, there was such a camaraderie between all of them um, that if somebody who didn't know came onto the set, who didn't know the show, they would hardly know who was who or who was, uh, you know, a main role or a bigger role. So I think it might be more fun for people in that show than perhaps maybe in other shows, if you're always in a scene, but you don't have as much to do, and you're also not recognized for your unique personality, which Sonequa recognizes with anyone, everyone. Yeah. Um, but I can, I can say that on Discovery, it's a really great family atmosphere. So Aww, that's yeah. beautiful. I love that. Really great family atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. But yeah, your point's well taken too in the context of, of folks who just, who have a fairly limited line that, that they probably are just, like you said, that if they're fairly young, they're probably happy to have a position. They're right happy now. to be working. <laughs> Actors are happy to work. Um, yeah, and all the more so in a great environment, no less too. Right. Yes. And then if they, you know, you'll notice that as um, Discovery has uh, evolved, um, they have given more attention to the specific yeah. characters, especially yeah. like the last episode nine, mm -hmm. what fun for all of them. Yes. And then they had that whole fight, you know, uh, you know, they just, um, th so they're giving more and more attention to the specific um, 
trajectories of each of those bridge members, which yeah. is nice. Yeah, it's been nice seeing, especially more with Detmer and Awosa coming up in the front. I mean, yes, we've definitely yeah. seen them have a lot more lines than, oh, yeah. first, especially in the first season. There, they, yes. they didn't have much to say yes. then, but now we see yes. a lot. That's and people, cool. I think the fans often would say, we want to know what's going on with them too. So yeah. I think the writers heard that and they probably were intending to do it anyway. It's just probably. that you've got a big responsibility as a writer have to, to build try the to tell yeah. the stories and build the, you know, the storyline. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was fun. It was fun in that last episode in episode nine too. the, the, the makeup that they had to, it was very dramatic, which I think it was probably true in the, episode, in the first season, but I didn't really notice it, but the, the evil eye makeup on so many right, people, right, like on right. Detmer and on Michael and on what was it? Yeah. Cause you get that mirror universe. And so everyone has fun, you know, yeah. uh, costumes and the wardrobe and the makeup and the hair, they, they just, and the actors, uh, yeah. just have so much fun just letting loose to be, yeah. you know, anything goes in the mirror universe. I particularly, you know, uh, there's so many things to say, but that was a, a fun episode and a, a very um, engaging episode. Like you, it was. Were, you were watching and thinking, what exactly is um, George Joe going to have to do to have 5% chance of saving yourself? Right. <laughs> I, I loved um, Anthony having his, uh, I feel like I'm mentioning him a lot lately because I, I do notice the kind of development of that character, but also the writers, um, what's cool about writers in a series, and this wouldn't be possible in a short movie, you just have to cast it right in a, you know, uh, in a short movie, but in a TV series, the writers can, as they get to know the actors and yeah. what unique gifts each actor brings, they can write to that. So Anthony, they gave Anthony that kind of Shakespearean Kenneth Branagh uh, speech, which was so fun. Um, you know, so great. And he just jumped into that because that was amazing. Didn't end well for him. Actor. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was great. And then he got it because he was a trader. But, um, but yeah, that, that was really fun to see that. And, and um, I'm just, you know, I, I sound, I sound like a broken record saying I sound like a broken record, but uh, each episode is just so beautiful to watch um just the production value is beyond and with all of that um the uniqueness each actor is coming across as, as completely unique which is also the writing and i i just am enjoying um i'm just yeah. enjoying so much about yeah I mean, I could take a cast list and then go through each, each uh, <laughs> character and the actor and the, you know, we don't have time for that, but I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying um, this. Same. Yeah. This season. Same. I just am um, thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah. It'd be very interesting to see what happens with the part two to the, to this. Uh, part two. Firma. I'm very much looking forward to. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I have to say that I kept wondering, you know, how the Terran universe, the, the thing is to die in battle and to, um, you know, to have an honorable death. Very Klingon. I kept wondering, <laughs> I kept wondering two things, which everyone's wondering, is Jason coming back next week? Yes. Of course, everyone's wondering. I kept waiting for him to show up in that episode. So that was cool to wait for that. And then I was wondering, do they need, do they need to kill off Giorgio because she has to go off and do her own show? <laughs> mm. Um, mm. So I kept thinking, they're either going to have this glorious, she saves, she gets saved, you know, she's brilliant because she's so, you know, she's so wily and smart that she'll make it through that 5%, you know, narrow eye of a needle and she'll survive. Or does she have to have this glorious, admirable death, only practically speaking, because the actress is doing needs to go a over different to different Star Trek, else. the Giorgio. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I don't know. It will we'll be interesting for, sure. interesting for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts? Um, I can't think of anything else. Oh, I loved Doug's character trying to come up with a word <laughs> that of his own. And he's like, execute. And then everyone is, everyone's like looking. And that, that, that was funny. Um, very that was funny. very, very funny. <laughs> Um, I like Tilly's version of, you could try a different spin on like hit it. Yeah. 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 And then that didn't work. Cause he said, you know, uh, that it was very funny. Yeah. 
was great. Yeah. I was not trying to think, what would I say? I'd probably just be like, go. Just <laughs> do it. Yeah. <laughs> Set a course. Like, you don't need to go. Just do it. Go. <laughs> do it. We all know what we're doing here. Do it. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. That was funny. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing thank this you. with me again this week. And, and thank you all to, for those of you tuning in. Uh, make sure to tune in next time for the next episode of Biotrekkie with the Admiral and live long and prosper. <laughs>